Have you ever asked yourself what would happen if you took a 24-year-old Caterham, a modified 1.6-litre EcoBoost engine from a Fiesta ST and a bucket load of money to a motorsport engineer? Yeah, me neither. But about two or three weeks ago, I got a random message off a fella called James saying he might have something I'd potentially be interested in making a video on. And when he told me that he'd taken his 24-year-old Caterham, an EcoBoost engine and a bucket load of cash to Gemzo Motorsport, I had to at least let him take me out in it to see what it was all about. And spoiler alert, it's fucking rapid. It was the first time I'd been out in a Caterham, so it was quite the experience. Even breaking down was fun, but I promised I wouldn't mention that in the video. Whoops. Anyway, let me take you around this freshly built machine from 1998, which is now faster than any modern car that Caterham produced from factory. It's going to be a good one, so grab yourself a cuppa, get sat down, and let's get into it. Now these things are mental, aren't they? The formula that Caterham have followed for the 7 has been the same since the company began. Remove everything that isn't necessary to make the car as light as possible. You can tell that its predecessor was a Lotus, can't you? Like Lotus, the plan was never to throw a stupid size engine under the bonnet because, you know, that generally means extra weight, and more weight means you're slower. That is true. Unless you make so much power that the laws of physics no longer apply, like Andy Forrest's Wild West field. Christ, look at that thing go. James's car is a little bit more tame. Yeah, he likes taking it to the track too, but it's mainly for road use, so there's no crazy aero on it or anything like that. Instead, there's just a set of sticky Avon tyres stopping him from barrel rolling through a farmer's field. Let's just quickly run you through the basics of a standard one of these though before we get into the engine swap so you can fully understand how ridiculous it actually is. So they might all look the same, but there are a lot of different variations, and by that I mean different engines. This one originally had an 8 valve block out of a Vauxhall in it, producing 100 brake horsepower. Might not sound like a lot, but because they only weigh 545 kilos, it could still hit 60 mile an hour faster than a modern Fiesta ST. Later on down the road, the guy who built the car, because remember that's what you could do to save a little bit of dosh when you bought one of these from factory, tuned it up to a mind bending 140 brake horsepower, and that's where it stayed for the last 15 to 20 years. Well, until now. So this car was already faster than a Fiesta ST back when it was running a mere 100 ponies. You can imagine what it'd be like if they'd just taken the standard 1.6 litre EcoBoost engine out of a Mark 7 ST and transplanted that into this 7. 179 brake horsepower wouldn't have exactly been a slouch, would it? But the engine wasn't being donated directly from a Ford. Nope, this was coming out of Gemzo Motorsport's Time Attack Caterham, so instead of 179, it was making a mental 300 brake horsepower. And the best part is because the EcoBoost lump is made from aluminium alloy, there is next to no difference in the weight between how it sits now and what it was like when it was built by old Bob back in 1998. As you might know, there are a few companies out there like Mountune, Puma Speed and Revo that can take these EcoBoost engines up to and beyond the power that this thing is running. However, the engine bay in a Fiesta is a little bit bigger than this, so pretty much everything was developed by Gemzo and made bespoke to squeeze into something the size of a coffin. Ideal car this if you're a goth. It's running an SCS Delta ECU with some pretty trick bits on it. Launch control, adjustable traction control, yada yada yada, all the gear that you want to run on a fully fledged track car. And because you asked nicely, I'll show you how this thing launches too later on in the video, so make sure you stick around for that. First off though, you have to figure out how to get in the fucking thing since someone's put a climbing frame over the seat. It's not a bad idea, mainly because it's there to save your life. But also, if you can't squeeze through the scaffold, you've got no chance of fitting your ass into those seats. That looked like they were made from old Tupperware, and it isn't every day you jump into a car thinking, Jesus, a Lotus is like a Rolls Royce compared to this. But weirdly, because the seats are that tight, they're actually quite comfy. And James has even driven this thing over onto the continent and made it all the way back without needing crutches when he got out. Once you're in and buckled up though, that's where the catering experience begins. Because you're so low down and you don't have a windscreen or even any doors, there's nothing else that compares to it. Even tootling along at 30 miles an hour feels like you're setting a land speed record, which did make me wonder why James had dropped a lot of money on this engine conversion. Because I mean, if this thing topped out at 130 mile an hour with the old 8 valve block, that's surely more than enough to stop you from getting bored when you're blasting over the moors. And then he put his foot down, and I can totally understand why he's done it. Jesus Christ, this thing is an absolute rocket. 
The closest thing that I've been in that compares to it isn't even a car, it's that slingshot ride that you get at dodgy fairgrounds. But even with traction control wound right down and some pretty well-worn tyres underneath us, this thing hooks up so well and it just flings you into the next village in no time. If you can change gear fast enough, it's a sub 3 second 0 to 60 time, and because you've been dead good and stayed so long, here's that launch I was talking about. <laughs> Before, James told me that you could rag the old car through every gear pretty much all of the time, but now it's just a case of do you dare shift into fourth because you're going to be doing triple digits, and that's kinda scary when you've got no windscreen, because headbutting a pheasant at that speed is going to really, really hurt. Not that we ever went above 60 mile an hour while filming this because that would be breaking the law, wouldn't it, officer? Even with me as a passenger, so that's an extra 70 kilos, the car just feels so balanced. There's no snappy oversteer, which I'm not going to lie, I was kind of expecting since you sit so close to the back wheels, and I can only assume that's because the centre of gravity is so low, so there isn't any weight transfer. The clutch is taking some getting used to, it's a case of either having a racing launch or stalling it, but I don't think I caught any of them on camera, so I think I'll let you off James. Everybody needs to experience what it's like driving in one of these things, even if it doesn't have 560 brake horsepower per tonne. It is driving at its purest form, it's just a road legal go-kart essentially. And I think I appreciate this particular car even more than most because it gets driven. The first night we went out was unreal, the sun was shining and it was nice and warm. The second time was, well, Baltic. <laughs> which would have been enough to put most people off, but literally any excuse James has to go out and drive this thing is good enough for him. It's not a show car, it's there to serve a purpose of being the best possible thing to drive, and well, fucking does its job alright. That's enough from me though, I hope you enjoyed the video, it was a lot of fun for me to make. Remember to do all of the usual stuff, you know, like, share and subscribe, or whatever you want, anything is appreciated. And yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Mm -hmm.